you, Cheryl. And it's now my very great pleasure to introduce Mark Erdman. Uh, Mark is a lecturer in art history at the University of Melbourne, and he did his PhD in Japanese art and architectural history at the University of Harvard. He's also studied at the University of London, uh, University of Tokyo, and the University of Osaka. And Mark has lived 15 years in Japan, so is very well qualified to lead tours in that beautiful part of the world. He has particularly specialised on castles, master carpenters, and the artistic exchange with Jesuit missionaries, which all sounds very intriguing. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome Dr. Mark Erdman to talk to us tonight about castles and other wonderful things in pre-modern Japan. Welcome, Mark. Hello, everyone. I just want to add kind of a little bit about myself and where I'm coming from with all of this and that I'm, you can probably tell by my accent, I'm American. I grew up in Boston and in the city of Boston, there's a lot of universities. And because of this, I was very lucky at a young age to meet a, a family moved in next door to me with two boys and they were Japanese. And I became very, very close with this family and I learned a lot about Japan from them. And from this, it just sparked something where it just became an ongoing career where I took up art history and architectural history and went on and on to this. And this is what I want to share with you today is my passion and my interest in Japanese architecture and the history of it. And today I'm going to try to do something that's a little bit difficult and I'm hoping that I succeed, but happy to take questions at the end. I want to try to explain about a thousand years of history in Japan through the lens of architecture. And more specifically, I want to try to explain how Japanese architecture, as we know it today, this traditionally renowned uh, tradition that's appreciated for its simplicity and use of natural materials, that it's in large part a product of a very unique political and cultural paradox on the Japanese archipelago. And to start this discussion, I'm beginning here with Himeji Castle and the fact that in the scheme of world history, it is actually a really, really unusual structure in this. So Himeji was constructed in 1608, just at the end of a prolonged period of civil war in Japan and at the start of a prolonged period of peace in Japan that lasted all the way up until uh, 1868. Now, if you look at Himeji from almost any angle, its functions as a structure are pretty explicit. On the one hand, it's a military defensive structure. It's designed to prevent invaders from entering it and attacking its inhabitants. And this is really obvious in, in, in several aspects. The first being the steep dry stone foundations. That is to say, there's no mortar or cement in these kind of uh, foundations at the base here. And also it's seen in these small holes here. These different size portals serve different functions for as arrow portals where you can project arrows to attack invaders. On the other hand, the function of the castle is that it, it serves as a symbol of authority. It's placed on this small hill and it towers over the adjacent city. And as such, it serves as a constant reminder that the local warlords or specifically the samurai or the warrior class govern the land during this period of time. Now, the second function, while it seems really, really obvious for us, was in 1608 a very, very new idea. Only 60 years earlier, all castles would have looked something like this. Either they would have been kind of high up on a mountain, very far away from the town, you can see here and beneath, or in the middle of a marsh out in the middle of nowhere. Places that are very, very inaccessible. Now in Japanese, the, the word for this and the castle of Himeji is the same. They're both called Shiro. But for me, I like to make a distinction that these are forts and what you see later, these are castles. Now, these forts, they're fantastic for defending, but they're absolutely terrible for developing an economic foundation or just accessing. That is to say, they're actually really difficult to live in these places because you're, you constantly have to move goods up and down and up and down from them, and you can't interact with the locals um, very easily. And herein lies a very strange fact about Japan. This is a country that's almost synonymous with martial culture in the form of samurai and ninjas and swords and martial arts, um, judo, akita, aikido. But military architecture, and that's something I define as kind of any structure that has a martial function, such as ramparts or walls or archers, perch, keeps, towers. It was a very 
late architectural tradition to emerge in Japan. In most countries, invaders prompted soldiers to build walls and then walled cities. And then the grand size of these walls were recognized as symbols of power of authority and strength of a ruler. And so you get castles as symbols of authority. However, in Japan, military architecture was seen for most of Japanese history as a symbol of failed rule. And as such, something that had to be taken down immediately after its function expired. That is to say, when a conflict ended. Now, this fact is especially odd um, if you go to Japan, because when you go to visit castles like Himeji, um, there's this real emphasis on the practical, functional nature of them as, as defensive structures. You'll see a lot of places where they you can throw rocks down. But the fact of the matter is that Himeji and most castles that you understand as the stereotypical Japanese castle, they never saw a single battle. Structures such as the ones that we see here um, better embody these functions, but they are reconstructions, both of these. They were never deemed worth maintaining. They were designed to be temporary and they were taken down after the fact. And so this raises an interesting question about why was it so obvious in other cultures to use martial architecture as a symbol of authority and strength? But why in Japan, with its proud tradition of warrior culture, wasn't it used as a symbol in Japan until the 16th century? And there's a lot we can learn from this question in general. So the simple answer to all of this is that Japan is an island and that there weren't at that many invaders. There was a threat of an invasion in the 8th century by the Tang Dynasty and lots of preparations were made for this, but it never really amounted to anything. There was a Mongolian invasion in the 13th century, but this happened on the island of Kyushu, far away from kind of the centers of power. But this aside, it doesn't account for kind of internal strife. Um, I already mentioned the civil wars of kind of the 15th and 16th century. And so why didn't it emerge as kind of a viable kind of expression of power? And this, we have to go back in time to kind of be able to figure out. So Japan initially built its political systems upon a fusion of indigenous beliefs and Chinese models. And from the Chinese model, they imported this idea of an emperor. But in order to decide who the emperor was or kind of determine this, it was identified based on a lineage and a lineage that was rooted in kind of the indigenous religious beliefs, something known as Shinto or the way of the gods. It's um, kind of an animistic religion that uh, believes that all kind of elements in nature possess some kind of divine nature in them. So, for instance, if you have an old enough tree, it would have a god in it that you can worship or there's a kind of an impressive rock. It would have kind of a god in it that you can pray to. And the emperor was identified as a descendant of the sun goddess Amaterasu no Omikami. And critical for our purposes here, the notion of an emperor, this idea imported from China, was one that was derived from Confucian thought. And it was based on a notion that a, t a leader must have a mandate from heaven. And the mandate of heaven is this notion that a ruler, if they're doing their job right, and have done kind of properly manage the relationship between heaven and earth, will have bounty from heaven. There will be good harvests and there will be a happy and thriving populace. But if they mess up, then heaven will drop plagues and earthquakes and make it known that the ruler does not have a mandate. Now, in this way, this is a little bit similar to the European divine right of kings, but owing to the syncretic nature of Japanese religion, it gets a little bit more complicated. So as a Consequence of the divine or religious nature of the mandate and the religious nature of the emperor, the court heavily initially relied on the clergy to demonstrate or articulate this power or the authority of the emperor. And it was by way of patronizing religious institutions, both Buddhist and Shinto, um, these kind of overlap as, as a general whole. This is the way to express or show that heavenly favor was in the hands of the emperor at large. And this is exactly what we see, particularly in places such as the city of Nara. Nara was the ancient capital in the, the 8th century Japan. And there, it is utterly littered with Buddhist temples. And in this case, these temples all were developed as part of a way to harness through prayer divine forces and in turn demonstrate and prove the authority of a divine emperor. And the most famous and striking example of this union between the imperial court and the Buddhist, uh, Buddhist institutions is this temple here, um, Todaiji, or the Great Eastern Temple. And Todaiji was constructed in the 1740s by Emperor Shomu after a very difficult decade of um, a coup attempt, a smallpox epidemic, poor crops, and a rebellion. And to deal with all this, Shomu doubled down on his faith. 
More specifically, he decided to construct a monumental Buddha in the style of those on the continent, such as at Luoyang, and such as in Afghanistan. There are the famous Bamiyan Buddhas that were destroyed by the Taliban in the early, uh, early part of this century. And he decided to build the largest monumental Buddha ever and house it in the largest timber frame structure ever built. And this project consumed resources of millions of people. And in this way, it refocused his subject's resources on kind of a singular goal. And the temple still exists today, and it remains one of the most popular spots to visit in Japan here. And what we're seeing here in the upper corner here is the Great Buddha Hall. And this is an 18th century rebuilding of it. It was burned down two times over, and the only original part of it is the uh, lower part of the Great Buddha statue down here. You can see kind of in the knee. And there's been recent research done on it, which is quite interesting, where they x-rayed the knee and they found that there were relics within it in the form of a tooth, along with beads and a sword. And the tooth is thought to be a relic of the Emperor Shomu himself. Um, I add this kind of annual cleaning up here just to give a sense of the scale, because if you see this without any people here, it is a very, very large statue, to say the very least. But it's actually a lot smaller than the original version of it. Up top here, you're seeing the 18th century version of the building that sits here today. But below this is a reconstruction of the Great Buddha Hall as it stood in the 8th century. The Buddha itself was about two meters taller in this earlier version. And the complex also had these two 100 meter tall pagodas. And pagodas are structures that hold relics within them. You don't just put them in knees of giant Buddhas. You put them inside of these buildings and entomb them in there. So if you have a tooth of the Buddha or a tooth of kind of a famous saint, you put their bones and teeth in there as something to worship. Now, why so large? Why make something so big like this, other than being kind of impressive? Now, the answer can be found on some of the only remaining remnants of the original Great Buddha there, the flower petals at its base. And you can see the large flower petal here with designs in gold on it. And they reveal a worldview that's based on a newly imported Buddhist sutra at the time. A sutra is a religious text, and it's something called the Flower Garland Sutra. And it describes the universe that has as its center at it a single Buddha named Vairoshana. Now, just to be sure we're all on the same page, a Buddha, the one you probably are familiar with or know about is Shakyamuni Buddha. And Shakyamuni Buddha was an Indian prince who basically discovered or invented Buddhism or preached it in India. And Buddha actually means just awakened one. And so it is really, anyone can become a Buddha. And there are many, many different types of Buddhas. And essentially, Buddhas are just people who have kind of realized the folly of the cycle of birth and rebirth that we exist in and that we live in. And they have figured out how to get beyond it and live in kind of an enlightened state. They have reached nirvana. Now, you see this Buddha, Vairashana, here on the, the right. And he's depicted in the upper part of the pedestal here. And he's said to be, and, and he is what, what he's depicted as doing here, is presiding over the entirety of the universe here. And so you see in these kind of small images down here and here and these registers here, that he is sitting um, and looking over these mountainous terrains, these the, the earths or many different planets, and is surrounded by oceans with the sun and the moon in them. It can get complicated here in quite detailed, but the fact, it's quite simple. Emperor Shomu is showing in this hierarchical vision that his reign is like that of Vairoshana. He was the center of the universe. And through the expression of Buddhist faith in sponsoring this temple, he both creates um, himself as a center and he presides over a center and then established subsidiary temples that were charged with overseeing all, all of the, the provinces around him. Now, Nara represents one extreme in the interweaving of the throne and the Buddhist institutions here. And it was right after Emperor Shomu's reign that a Todaiji monk ended up having a little bit too much influence. He's thought to have had a romantic affair with Emperor Shomu's daughter, an empress in her own right, Empress Koken. And because of this, it was felt that the clergy needs to be held at a little bit more distance and kind of um, kept away from the throne uh, and not had be given as much direct access to it. But the way of showing authority and, and expressing authority was still the same. The way that you kind of expressed architecturally that you were in charge is that as an emperor or in the imperial court, you sponsor temples and you sponsor temples such as these. Now, the capital would move it from Nara to what is today Kyoto in 794. 
And in doing so, uh, multiple sites were developed as, as Buddhist, uh, Buddhist sites. On the left here, you see Toji Temple, which is kind of right near Kyoto st Station right now. Um, it's one kind of one of the treats you see from the uh, bullet train uh, when you go by. The, the pagoda here is from the um, 18th, 17th century, but it kind of stands out. And on the right here, you see the oldest building in all of Kyoto. It is a pagoda from Daigoji Temple, and it, it's quite a magnificent and amazing structure in the sense that this five-level pagoda was built in the 10th century. And for a country that is the most earthquake-prone place on Earth, it's a remarkable engineering achievement in that you have basically in the center of it a, a tall pillar that diffuses the energy and wobbles inside of it to kind of diffuse the energy produced by an earthquake. And it has lasted for a millennia because of this. Now, both of these temples are imperially sponsored, and while they functioned as religious institutes, they ultimately served as an architectural expression of authority of the sovereign. Now, the imperial court that took over from the clergy, they had a big problem. And the problem was that the Chinese imperial system that they adopted, heaven would clarify who should rule with all these kind of disasters and so forth. But in Japan, the native tradition dictated that the emperor was a god. He was descended from the sun goddess, and consequently, to go against him was to literally go against heaven. And so this meant that it was impossible to uh, rebel against the emperor directly and overthrow him using violence. You could not install yourself as the new emperor because no matter how powerful you were, you did not have the pedigree to overthrow him. Over time, and as I'm about to explain, the court learned to play a new game of controlling the emperor by having daughters marry him and then controlling the grandson who would become the new emperor. And initially, they're very successful at this, but then they get replaced by hired mercenaries. The guys that they hired to control the farms and their income from the provinces, gentlemen that came to be known as samurai. And the word samurai kind of reflects this status. Um, it comes from a verb, saburao, which is essentially kind of to serve. Um, these are the people that serve the court at the time. And they took over and established their own military government, something known as the shogunate. And ultimately, the mandate of heaven would fall on them. So the dynamic of having an immovable emperor and kind of the responsibility of the mandate of heaven falling on the imperial court and then on the samurai has huge implications. Now, if people were building forts and getting ready for war, as the Chinese system of uh, the mandate of heaven dictated, this was a sign of poor rulership. But according to the Japanese system, it was not the emperor's fault, as he is a god, but rather it was a sign of the failure of those people around him, the people who built these structures. So put it another way, any direct system uh, attack is a lose-lose situation. So say you're somebody with a lot of money and a lot of influence and a lot of soldiers, you build a fort, you're going to go against heaven, and if you raise an army, you're going to go against heaven. And if you attack the emperor directly, you are going against heaven. And therefore, you are not fit to rule. So the point is, you need to have the emperor on your side and get this approval somehow. And this resulting tension from this relationship had an enormous effect on the history of Japanese architecture. So first and foremost, kind of it made permanent examples of martial architecture something to be avoided as a sign of disaster. Also, and this is more of a side note, it made for a comparatively humble imperial palaces. So you see up here, this building is called the Shishinden, and it is a structure that is at the heart of the imperial palace in Kyoto. And it is where essentially the, the home of the Japanese emperor uh, was from the 14th century up until the late 19th century, and where he would be coronated, our new emperor would be constantly coronated. And if you see it in comparison to a structure such as the Forbidden City in Beijing or kind of Versailles Palace in France, it's comparatively rather modest, all things considered. It's untreated wood, very raw, natural wood. Um, it's, it's cypress shingles on the roof of it. It's a big structure to be sure, and it's a very nice structure to be sure, but it's not as overwhelming or awe-inspiring as these examples of rulers in other cultures. And it's a reflection of the emperor's relative position to those in actual power. Now, the next element that this tension between the emperor and the rulers, so to speak, was that it opened the door to new architectural innovations. And this is the first of kind of two styles of architecture that I want to introduce here. here. And it's something called Shinden-styled architecture or palace-styled architecture. Now, 
no examples of Shinden uh, style architecture remain, but um, we know from archaeological evidence that it was characterized by a C-shaped structure with a main palace at the front, uh, a garden in front of the main palace. And I want to point out here in particular, it typically had a small fishing pavilion here where that could go and you can engage with kind of a nice pond in front of it. And this was initially the, the style of home for the Japanese court. And then as samurai took over, they adopted the, the same style as the architecture of choice. Now, Shinden style architecture is not product and proof of a display of court supremacy. Rather, it was developed as a tool and a means to manage the inherited contradiction embedded in the system and essentially get the emperor on your side. So I'm going to zoom in here to this 15th century scroll here to get a kind of a sense of what's going on here. Now, this 15th century scroll is actually a copy of a 10th century painting, and it describes various court rituals that needed to be performed by the court on an annual basis. And they're essentially a record so that future generations would know how to conduct these rituals properly. So the Shinden Palace, besides being a residence, was essentially... Its main function was there to facilitate the rituals of state and create parties for emperors to be entertained at. And by hosting an emperor at a building like this, you're making him happy and you're essentially placating a god and earning his favor. And to accomplish this, these structures required several things. They required a southern view where you see the emperor who would be seated here. The emperor is almost never depicted in paintings like this because he's a god and you just don't do that. But you would have kind of courtiers sitting out in front of him and a space in front of him where more courtiers would line up. And a staging area then in front of him across on the pond where drums would be played. And then you see some boys on a boat here playing different instruments as well. It's essentially kind of a lively concert. And these are both to make the emperor happy and enjoy his favor, but it's also an opportunity to introduce your daughters to the emperor who might become a concert and produce an heir to the throne as well. Now, these types of events soon become ritualized. And there's become to be known something called an imperial progression. Multi-day parties in which a powerful host has an emperor come to visit him. And what you see here are several examples of, of places that hosted imperial progressions and how they form the foundation for the culmination in Japanese castles. All of these represent efforts to leverage religious and cultural power in order to manage the symbolic power of the emperor in order to serve the needs of the true ruler. And I want to go through each of them little by little. And I'll start with the upper left corner, probably the most famous structure here, the Golden Pavilion. And the Golden Pavilion was constructed by this gentleman, a shogun, that is to say, kind of the leader of the samurai or uh, military government of the time. But note, however, that he is not dressed in any kind of martial form, and he is, in fact, shown as an ordained monk. But not only that, he's sitting on a tatami mat here down below, a straw mat that has the decorative patterns here, something that's called an ungenberi tatami mat. And this pattern is something that's exclusively reserved for the imperial family. So he's being a little bit audacious here. And all this is to say is that while this gentleman, Yoshimitsu, was an extremely powerful figure as a shogun, he was both interested in and obliged to mix his warrior identity with other identities in order to maintain and sustain his claims to power. And... To this end, and probably his most famous attempt to do this, was the building of this structure. He would build Kinkakuji, or the Gold Temple of the Golden Pavilion, as a retirement villa that would be slated to become a mortuary temple for him after his death. This is to say, the divide between the secular and the religious is not really there. They're one and the same. It's a temple that he lived at. Construction starts in 1392, and it's ultimately finished in 1397. Unfortunately, this is a reconstruction. It was burned down in 1950. Remarkably, it survived the Second World War and then was burned down by a crazy monk. And then it was rebuilt using the very precise plans that existed about it in 1955. If you want to know more about that, I recommend reading. There's a famous novel by the author Yukio Mishima called The Golden Pavilion. Now, more importantly, 
King Kakuji served as the site of an imperial progression, the visit by an emperor where he was maintained over multiple days. Now, we don't know much about the Yoshimitsu's imperial progression, but the shogun after him did another one. And from that, there's very detailed records that exist from the 1437 version of it. And on day one, the emperor would arrive in his carriage. There would be a huge banquet. There would be toasts to each other. And then the shogun would dance around in the garden to entertain. Day two, more dancing. Kemari. Kemari is a form of kickball, essentially, where you have five courtiers standing around and kicking a ball between each other in a competition. It's a little bit like hacky sack. Then poetry. Day three, more dancing. Day four, no special banquet, but there seemed to be playing an intensive drinking game. And then day five, more kickball, boats, uh, more performances and poems. And then day six, exchanges of gifts, and the emperor goes home. Now, to accomplish all of this, Yoshimitsu essentially employed here the same trick that the court had invented of inviting the emperor over to their home and showing off this stuff. But he makes it both recognizable in kind of the things that they do, but fresh in the architecture that he uses. Now, the Golden Pavilion is rooted essentially in the Shinden style. And it has, you can see down here, a little bit of a balcony that sticks out. And this is corresponding to or attempting to minimize or kind of create the fishing pavilion that we saw earlier earlier on it. It's also strategically deployed around here in the bottom. You can see more in the axiometric diagram here. These are storm shutters that you can pull up here. And this is another feature of um, Shinden style architecture that, that has been incorporated here. It's the undecorated level of it. But then in the upper levels here, you see very interesting and new things and fresh things here to dazzle here. You don't see this type of building very often in Japan. And first and um, foremost, and kind of the most obvious thing is the gold, the gold exterior to it. And there's a conflation here of what it means to be a ruler and a religious leader. Now, this is called the Golden Pavilion, not just because it is a literal description, but it's an attempt to hearken or evoke a Tang Dynasty story. And the story is about a, a pilgrim named Doi, who made a pilgrimage to Mount Wutai and had a dream about a golden temple. And he would go back to the, the Chinese emperor in Chang'an and then asked, told him what he saw. And the Chinese emperor allowed him to build a golden temple on Wutai. Now, this set up this narrative that Yoshimitsu felt very, very close to. And what he decided to do was title himself the king of Japan, Minamoto Dogi. So styling himself as this monk from ancient China and creating for himself a similar structure. Now, the structure, however, the way to articulate it or kind of make sure everybody knows that it's Chinese is that he creates it in the form of this pavilion. And this is something that lots of people were importing at the time, these structures of pavilions overlooking bodies of water and so forth. And to make things extra clear, he incorporates several elements called Zen-styled architectural elements. Now, they don't appear in this painting here, but in the building here, um, the Golden Pavilion, you can see these kind of structural elements and these cusp-shaped windows here at the top, and then the, the, the lattice doors here as well. And ultimately, this is a hybrid Chinese Zen-styled structure and a Japanese Shinden-style structure to like show off and maintain this relationship with the emperor. Now, I'm going to jump here to the 15th century and the next great Ashikaga shogun, Yoshimasa. And he's the one who presides over the beginning of this Civil War period. Again, kind of worth taking note what's going on in the, the painting here. And you see him surrounded by, again, Chinese ink landscape style painting. And he is most famous for building this structure, the Silver Pavilion. It's a response to and an attempt to emulate the Golden Pavilion, but on a tight budget. Again, it was built right at the outset of a civil war. And like the Golden Pavilion, it was a place that was used for an imperial progression, although heavily reduced in scale. But that building is not really the most important or interesting structure that was developed in the, in the Temple of the Silver Pavilion. It is this building here, which is most people overlook, and it's large part because you're not allowed to go into it more often than not. And inside of this building, you see the earliest example of something called showing styled architecture. And I, I always use this bad joke with my students. show in styled is used for show in stuff. As you see here, show in styled architecture is characterized by this use of staggered shelves and a desk area. And show in translates directly to desk, tatami mat floors, and views onto the gardens and these paper shoji screens. Now, 
Again, like Shinden style architecture, it's not a product and proof of court supremacy, but it's a tool to maintain the inherent contradiction embedded in the system. Shoin is like Shinden, but in its earliest stages, it was a way of doing it on the cheap. What these are used for is not just entertaining the emperor, but showing to the emperor and showing to other people Chinese objects. Ashikage Yoshimitsu began importing huge amounts of Chinese paintings, and in particular ceramics, and using them as displays of the wealth and the power of the shogunate. This got pared down, and the collection was, as it was handed down, became one of the last signs of legitimacy and power and ways to show off to the emperor at the time. And so you have lots of treaties written on kind of the proper ways of showing these objects. And this book we see up here is one that was written by one of the monk curators of the Shogunal collection as it began to be sold off during the civil wars of the 16th century. And it's essentially a guide to presentation that could help the rabble out in the provinces better appreciate and display their mastery over the culture of it. And one such figure who would have used this book is this gentleman, the first of the three so-called unifiers of Japan, Oda Nobunaga. And as Japan transcended into chaos, little by little, power began to be reconsolidated by local warlords in the provinces who brought together larger and larger armies. And Nobunaga, in his attempts to prove his legitimacy as a new ruler, was absolutely ruthless in his accumulation and presentation and display of these Chinese objects that were sold off by the previous shogunate and using them as uh, a means to show his, his, his pedigree as a ruler. He's also quite famous as being very, very nice to and very interested in the Jesuits. And that's why we have a nice portrait here that was made by some Jesuit missionaries who engage with him a lot. He's also quite famous for being a huge fan of the harpsichord, of all things. He would go out of his way to go to the Jesuit seminary to hear it. And where that took place is a place called Azuchi Castle. In 1576, Nobunaga would build on top of a mountain the prototype and the beginning of the Japanese castle form as we know it today. This edifice called Azuchi Castle, it would only exist really for three years, but it completely transformed the vocabulary for displaying power. And it launched the heyday of the Japanese castle. This heyday would only exist for about a hundred years, and then it became seen as an overly indulgent and wasteful form. But Azuchi launched this and did this by way of bringing together the ideas of, that we've seen before. Two from the exterior and one from the interior to frame himself as rich, sophisticated, and worldly. All this to say is that he wanted to show himself as a man who had the mandate from heaven. So one of the things that you can see in the keep or the upper stories of it, this is a reconstruction. The building no longer exists. It was destroyed after Nobunaga was assassinated, but there's an extended record on kind of how it originally looked. But you can see in the upper stories, he did his reference and nod to the Golden Pavilion, trying to emulate or copy that, seeing him as, as the successor to the shogunate. And there's also inside of it, there were shoin interiors in which he would show off Chinese rocks or Chinese paintings as well. Now, the site never hosted an imperial progression, but owing to the names of certain buildings around the, the keep here, and also from a daughter of one of his vassals, a letter that she wrote, we know that there was an intention to hold one here. It never happened, as I mentioned, because Nobunaga was assassinated in dramatic fashion. Now, in case you're interested, the director, Japanese director, acclaimed uh, director B. Takeshi just made a movie about this assassination, and it was just lauded and got several minutes of uh, applause during the Cannes Film Festival. And I think this movie will be coming out sometime in the next couple of months, so keep an eye out for that. But Nobunaga was succeeded by the second of the so-called unifiers, a man named Hideyoshi, and then these guys, who are where we will end things up. Now, on the left is the grandfather founds the Tokugawa dynasty, Tokugawa Ieyasu, and on the right is his grandson, Tokugawa Iemitsu, who frankly deserves a lot more credit for consolidating the power and creating the foundations for a lasting peace. Now, again, it's worth always looking at portraits and trying to see what they do, what they're trying to say about the sitter in it. And you see Tokugawa Ieyasu here, he's pulled out all the stops. And you see behind him another landscape that we saw with the earlier shogun, a Chinese-style ink landscape. And, but he's also seated and dressed in court robes. And then he's seated upon this familiar Ungenberi tatami pattern. So he's showing imperial connections. And then on top of it, you see his crests detailed all over this curtain. And 
And then in front of him, Chinese styled lions that um, protect shrines in general. So, I mean, he's really putting everything together and overdoing it and overcompensating for trying to uh, solidify his position as the first new shogun of this new era. His grandson, Iemitsu, does it in a different way, in an architectural way. And one of the things that he does and is most famous for is setting up an imperial progression at a place called Nijo Castle in Kyoto. And this is one of the premier sites in Kyoto right now. And it's it remains. And what's quite interesting about it, intriguing about it, is that this was a structure that was built for a singular purpose, for a one-week visit for the emperor to come in, um, what is it, 1626. Functionally after it, it served as a constant reminder of the Tokugawa as the political masters of the city, but its initial design was entirely for kind of a one-day event. And to this effect, there was originally a keep or a tower um, built. It would be situated up here in the upper left-hand corner, and you can see this is kind of in an old painting. And this would have been the largest building in all of Kyoto at the time and shown or demonstrated the power and the authority of the Tokugawa. And on the inside... It again brought back ideas of the Shoin style architecture. But instead of Chinese objects that were showed off here, the Shogun himself was the thing to be shown off. And you can see they have, even today, they have these uh, mannequins sitting around in it to give you a full sense of it. And where the Shogun would be sitting here, framed by this tree and framed by the shelves that we saw before and desk and outlet. This is something that's called the mature show in style, where the gold leaf is re-emphasized or implied in the interior to increase lighting ability for the spaces and, and such. But it really is more about showing the authority of the ruler and not the authority of the ruler through proxy of objects that they owned anymore. And so ultimately, I'm showing a little bit of a timeline here between the Golden Pavilion, the evolution of the Golden Pavilion, providing this exterior element of gold, the Togodo at the Silver Pavilion, adding this interior element of Shoenzuki Castle, which combines these elements. And then finally, Nijo Castle, which combines the elements and repositions the Shogun as having the Mandate of Heaven. And this brings us to the Edo period and the early modern period, where the Tokugawa build their own castle with a towering keep in the city of Edo. Edo eventually would become the city of, of Tokyo. And this image is from the early 19th century by the artist Hokusai. Hokusai is very well known for creating the Great Wave print. And it sums up the desire of the political climate rooted in this notion of the mandate of heaven and the tension between the emperor. One turret of Edo Castle you can see in the midground here, and it's just reaching above and touching into the heavens or into the sky above it. And behind it, you see Mount Fuji towering above. Mount Fuji here serves as a symbol of the divine and the divine world. And what connects the divine realm and the, the mundane world below is the tower and the, the authority of the shogunate. And below them is what you would like to see in a well-governed city. The city is bustling with people running around, commerce is plentiful, and the people seem to be happy. There's no violence, there's no death here. And this is the type of realm that you would like to see and that naturally comes from a government that is properly managed and managing the relationship with heaven and earth. And I just want to end on a little bit of a twist here to everything because it's a funny irony of history that what goes around comes around here. It's a strange irony that the Japanese imperial family has come now to inhabit what was once Edo Castle or what, what these turrets would be. This was an architecture that was once used to manage the imperial family and to subjugate them. And it has now become, in kind of in the modern day, a symbol of their presence and a symbol of their authority over kind of the Japanese state as a whole. I will end it there. I hope you enjoy this. And if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. That was really fascinating. You showed in that last picture, Mount Fuji. And mm -hmm. when I went to Japan, I was just so moved by the sight of Mount Fuji with cherry blossoms all in bloom, and it was just truly wonderful. But can you tell us why Mount, or how Mount Fuji has come to be the sort of archetypal symbol of Japan? That is a very good question, in fact. So when the capital was moved from Kyoto to Edo, um, where Tokyo is now, um, they had um, a little bit of a problem of um, kind of um, history. 
Um, it was a young and new spot to put the capital in. And one of the only elements of history that this the area had was Mount Fuji because it was mentioned in certain poems by courtiers from the 10th century. And so it was this evidence of that there was kind of culture and sophistication in the new capital. And so it was kind of the one of the the one landmark that could kind of prove that this was a sophisticated place that 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 cultured people had visited in the past. There's also the simple fact that it is absolutely gorgeous. Um, it sits on, a, it's a volcano. Um, it hasn't erupted since the 18th century. Fingers crossed it doesn't happen anytime soon, um, but it is a volcano. Um, and it has kind of, because of that, it, 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 it is a natural candidate for becoming kind of a, a god. And so it's easily identifiable or kind of seen as a deity in and of itself. And so it's, 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 it is because of that, it, it kind of embodies all of these 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 elements that has made it kind of a pure symbol of Japan. Thanks, Mark. I love the fact that the power of poetry was there from a very early stage, influencing uh, so many different things in history. Does anyone else have questions that they would like to ask Mark? Usually you see castles and things like that um, built of stone or mud brick or something like that. But all of these are built of wood. There's, there's rocks around there. Why choose wood? That is an excellent, excellent question. Japan definitely had the ability to construct stone castles. And you can see that in particular just in these dry stone foundations beneath the, the castles that they have there. And what eventually happens is it's, it's, it's a cost-benefit analysis. As I mentioned before, creating or building structures makes you an illegitimate force. Your attempts for power or your use of violence is illegitimate. It goes against the grain. It goes against the government. So when you build a construction or you build something kind of like when you have a conflict and you need to kind of go hide in the hills and do something, what you do is you rely on the natural topography. That's why you go up to a mountain and kind of hide yourself there because it's you have natural defenses supporting your campaign. But if you start building rocks and investing this much, then it's kind of a sign of permanence. And it, when it becomes permanent, your legitimacy level goes down and down. And so you quickly want to build is something as quick as you can with wood, which is the kind of the most immediately accessible material. And then you can immediately take it down and even repurpose and use that wood again to build another building later on. So by the time that you get to building castles that have symbolic clout, this tradition of building towers and structures with wood is so well established that the alternative is just never even thought of. And also, this highlights the contradiction that I spoke about in that these castles such as Himeji, they weren't built to actually fight in. If you shot fire arrows at a castle like that, it would immediately burn down. I mean, these were entirely constructed for symbolic purposes and not to really hold off an army or maintain a full siege. I was surprised that they valued so much the Chinese with their background paintings. I didn't realize that they had that connection at all. Um, it's, it's huge. For most of Japanese history, up until the late 19th century, China was seen as the cultural center of the world. Because of the lack of exposure to many other cultures or like their isolation, China was just always understood as the model of civilization, the greatest mm -hmm. kind of civilization that you could possibly emulate. And so yeah. like Chinese ceramics take on amazing symbolic weight. And that it's this exotic object created from the greatest civilization that we are aware of. And throughout Chinese history, Japan was always seen as this tributary state in reverse and poor imitation of them. But I mean, Japan owes more to China than probably any other civilization. Which is of the castles has the nightingale floor? Oh, <laughs> a wonderful question. So a nightingale floor is a defensive mechanism that's incorporated into the, the castle to when you step on it, it will make a squeak. And if you know where to step, then uh, uh, you can avoid it. But if you don't know, you will be uh, so you can't sneak into the, the castle and do it. 
Um, Nijo Castle has a Nightingale board in it, but that is the most famous one. Himeji does not have one. I'm trying to think if there's another beyond. There are temples with it, but Nijo Castle is kind of the most famous example. Quite wonderful. Uh, I, we did go many years ago, and it actually sings a song. Such a wonderful name, isn't it? A nightingale floor. I love it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> it sings it nice. Gosh, very interesting. I've learned a lot tonight. Thank you very much. Well, I hope you will all join with me in saying a very big thanks to Mark for a really fascinating visit to Japan. Uh, We've all learned a huge amount. We've been uh, delighted by gorgeous images. It's been a really wonderful evening. So thank you so much, Mark, for sharing your knowledge and your expertise. And I'm not at all surprised to hear that your Japanese tours are booking up very quickly indeed. (laughs) So thank you so much from all of us this evening. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.